Hello, my name is Jeff Helt. I am a beef technical services manager for a trace mineral company called Micronutrients. And uh, today we're going to uh, spend a few minutes discussing the uh, differences between trace mineral sources. However, before we get into that, just would real quickly like to uh, uh, mention uh, what is the goal uh, of trace mineral nutrition and, and why would these sources and their, their differences be important. And really at the end of the day, our goal around trace mineral nutrition is to get the mineral uh, past the rumen into the small intestine so it can be absorbed there and used by the animal for whatever biological purposes it needs. And why getting past the rumen is important is because most of our antagonistic reactions that we uh, uh, discuss and, and have issues with in the beef industry really are geared around sulfur and molybdenum and its tie up with copper. And that really happens most of the time that reaction happens in the rumen. And so our goal should be to get most metals out of the rumen into the small intestine for absorption by the animal. The only exception to that would be cobalt, where we want cobalt to be uh, uh, dissolved and dissociated in the rumen uh, for its benefits to the rumen bud. So we, we need to keep this in mind when we start talking about the sources and the potential differences of those sources with this goal in mind. Now, how are trace minerals different? Trace minerals are really distinguished by the substance the mineral is bound to, and this we call the ligand. If the bond to this ligand is too strong, the trace mineral can't be separated from it and the animal is unable to absorb it. If the bond to this ligand is too weak, the trace mineral separates from the ligand too soon, potentially in the feed or in the feed bag or in the rumen, which then it may bind with an antagonist and this reduces the animal's ability to absorb it. So really, uh, the goal around our trace minerals and, and uh, uh, the bonding structure that we want them to have should be neither too weak nor too strong, so they can hold together uh, in the feed and in the rumen and resist bonding to those antagonists. Thus, we can have more of the mineral uh, bypassing the rumen, getting it to the small intestine where it can be absorbed. And additionally, just like with about anything we buy, uh, these sources are gonna vary in their effectiveness to the animal and uh, obviously their cost as well. So the three main categories of trace minerals uh, that we deal with today are the inorganic trace minerals, organic and hydroxy trace minerals. And I'll go through these individually. Inorganic sources are a specific mineral bound to a non-carbon containing ligand. Examples of this would be copper oxide, zinc oxide, copper sulfate, manganese sulfate. These inorganic trace minerals uh, utilize both ionic and covalent bonds, and we'll discuss that here in a minute. But in general, ionic bonds are weak, that allow the mineral to, to, to disassociate quickly, and covalent bonds, which are stronger bonds, which allow the mineral to hold together tighter. These inorganic sources were developed in the 30s and are still used uh, today. Along came the organic trace minerals uh, in the 1970s. Uh, these are minerals that are specifically bound to a carbon or nitrogen containing ligand with the covalent bonding, with the goal uh, in mind to really uh, develop a mineral that would again bypass the rumen and present more of the metal to the small intestine for absorption by the animal. Examples of these would be uh, zinc amino acid complex, uh, copper proteinate, or a zinc polysaccharide complex. Just one example, or a few examples. And the most recent category of trace mineral is the uh, hydroxy trace minerals. These are a specific metal bound to a hydroxy or OH group as the ligand in a unique crystalline structure. These were developed in the 2000s and similar to uh, organic trace minerals, they would utilize covalent bonding as well. Uh, examples of these would be intelibon copper, intelibon zinc, and intelibon manganese. So to really look at this a different way, we have the main category of trace mineral, and then we have uh, under that uh, the inorganic trace minerals, which would include the sulfates, 
which contain, uh, which are uh, all uh, bonded uh, with the ionic bonds. And again, this bond is very weak and would allow the mineral to uh, disassociate in, in an aqueous solution quite rapidly. You have the oxide forms of trace minerals, uh, which uh, the oxides contain both ionic and or covalent bonds. The challenge with this is we really don't know what percent of each, and this really makes those sources uh, uh, highly uh, unpredictable. Uh, copper oxide is a great example of, of a metal that would be an inorganic trace mineral that has very strong covalent bonds that virtually make it unavailable to the animal. Zinc oxide would have both ionic and covalent bonds and its predictability is, is less than other sources because of that mixture of bonding. And then finally in that inorganic category, again, we have the hydroxy trace minerals that have the unique crystal instruction structure and a covalent bond that allows it to hold tighter through the rumen and make it to the small intestine. And then we have the organic uh, trace minerals, as I mentioned before, again, covalently bonded. And there's many types of organic trace minerals. Specific amino acid complexes, an amino acid complex, amino acid chelate, proteinate, polysaccharide complex, and propionates. These are all different types of organic trace minerals. Sometimes referred to as chelated, uh, technically that's not wrong. These minerals would be organic, and chelate is a certain type of organic that has a unique bonding structure. Again, all these would vary in their bond strength and efficacy to the animal, depending on exactly what is in that uh, carbon-containing uh, matrix for the ligand. So to illustrate what might happen with these different sources in the animal, in the rumen, uh, here uh, on the left, we have uh, an inorganic uh, trace mineral in Telebon copper that has the covalent bonds in a uh, beaker of water. On the right, we have an inorganic trace mineral uh, with an ionic bond. This would be copper sulfate. And you can see right away the water starts to turn blue, which means that product is starting to dissolve or disassociate and may become free metal. Now, if this was in the rumen, and we had a potential antagonist like sulfur added to it. Uh, on the right, uh, you see that black color. That would be the copper reacting with the sulfur, uh, forming a complex that would be insoluble for the animal and unavailable for it to, to absorb. On the left, we would see that uh, intelbon copper that didn't dissolve in water, and there's no black color. Therefore, it did not react uh, with uh, the sulfur, and so more of that copper would be potentially unavailable to the animal. So really just want to use this to illustrate that the ionic bonding uh, that we see or uh, uh, with the sulfate forms of trace minerals is not necessarily a good thing because they can disassociate quite rapidly uh, in the rumen and, and potentially then be unavailable to the animal. So to wrap up here, I also want to point out uh, that uh, regardless of source of trace mineral, uh, be it uh, zinc oxide, uh, zinc hydroxychloride, the zinc proteinate, the zinc amino acid complex, whatever they may be, once they get to the small intestine, they all are absorbed the same. It doesn't matter what source they originally started from, once they hit the small intestine, they have their specific transporters that they use uh, to be transported across the intestinal wall. Uh, so for example, a uh, copper transporter is called CTR, uh, the zinc transporter is called ZIP. Uh, so uh, copper, regardless of, of source, would use this CTR transporter and or zinc, uh, regardless of source, would use the uh, ZIP transporters. So again, with the goal in mind to get minerals to the small intestine, uh, then it doesn't matter. Once they hit the small intestine, the animal is going to use these transporters uh, to get it across the intestinal wall, regardless of how it was fed or what form it was when it was fed. So to wrap up here, uh, oops, excuse me, uh, to, to kind of put these all side by side, sulfate sources have ionic bonds, which can make them highly rumen soluble. 
Uh, however, they were very uh, uh, economical from a price standpoint. Think of those as salt or, or, or sugar. Uh, once they're in, in liquid, they would dissolve rather quickly. The oxides uh, have both ionic and covalent bonding, so their rumen solubility is mixed. Uh, and again, they would be a, a, a very economical source or lower price source of trace minerals. The organic sources, covalent bonding, which would give them better or more moderate rumen solubility. Um, however, they are probably the most expensive products on the marketplace. And then finally, there's the hydroxy category that would be covalently bonded, have low rumen solubility, and be a, have a price point somewhere in between uh, organics and inorganic trace minerals. Think of these two as more like a sugar cube, uh, dissolved much slower or solubilized much slower for the organics, and then the hydroxy uh, more like a, a hard candy lollipop, uh, much, much slower from its uh, solubility. So with that, I thank everyone uh, for the time today. Uh, if you have uh, any further questions or I stimulated a thought, uh, here's my contact information. Uh, please shoot me an email and I'll try to respond back as promptly as I can. Uh, thank you, uh, hope you pick something up today.